Greetings, I'm Dak Rulo, and this is Overwritten. In tonight's episode, we will continue our analysis of The Lonely Crowd. The Lonely Crowd was originally published in the year 1950, but almost every printing of the book available today includes a preface written for the third edition of 1969. David Reisman, who wrote the book in collaboration with Nathan Glazer and Rule Denny, wrote this preface as well, and he acknowledges therein the challenge of introducing the book to a different generation of readers. Although it may be difficult for us, living in the year 2022, to appreciate the tremendous psychological change that must have occurred among the American people between the years 1950 and 1969, Mr. Reisman witnessed it firsthand and experienced it personally. And he shares with us this summary of his observations, quote, Obviously, the problems that preoccupy attentive Americans now, in 1969, are different from those preoccupying people when The Lonely Crowd was written in 1950, and, among the reflective, an atmosphere of what seems to me extravagant self-criticism has succeeded an earlier tendency toward glib self-satisfaction." If this perspective seems to us at all passé or unremarkable, it is only because in our time it has become so prominent and so widespread. It may even be the majority perspective today, or at least the one perspective in which the majority of Americans could find common ground. We understand exactly what Mr. Reisman means when he speaks of the 1950s as a period of glib self-satisfaction. As soon as he says this, we envision the adolescence of the time, wearing deliberately gaudy clothing and driving around in luxurious cars and spending money at diners, record stores, and drive-in movie theaters. We envision them living in a state of perpetual bliss, enjoying themselves in the moment, without any premonition of the troubles and struggles that were soon to come for the United States. Now, we hardly need to say that this vision of ours is only the shallowest stereotype. It is a dull cliché that has been promoted largely by Hollywood. Nevertheless, the 1950s were indisputably a time of accelerated consumer consumption. As everybody already knows, Americans were buying and using and discarding with a perpetually hastening pace throughout the Eisenhower era. And this is symbolized in our image of teenagers dressing up and driving around and having a good time back then. We are imagining them behaving as consumers and obtaining considerable consumer satisfaction. On this point, everyone appears to be in agreement. Where we differ from one another is in our view of the moral and ethical values underlying this behavior, but we will not address that controversy today. Mr. Reisman's perspective is accessible to us also because we understand exactly what he means when he speaks of extravagant self-criticism. Clearly, he is speaking of the Vietnam era, which was still ongoing at the time he wrote his preface. When we envision the Vietnam era, we envision constant political conflict and dispute, pertaining not only to the war in Vietnam, but also to racial tensions and other social issues. Even the name of the period suggests that it was defined by its contentious political condition, as though this were the foundation upon which all else would come to be based. Maybe this is so, or maybe it is only another superficial stereotype, one that was also developed and distributed by the mass media. But in either case, we recognize that there was a difficult political situation forming at the time, in the 1960s, and that many Americans responded to it with a feeling of despair and pessimism for the future of their country. So how long did this despondent sentiment reign in the United States? Well, we can't answer this question precisely, not at this time, but we can affirm that it did eventually yield to yet another state of glib self-satisfaction. This new state of glib self-satisfaction appeared to become the majority condition at some point in the 1980s, approximately 20 years after the epoch of extravagant self-criticism. 
But the glib self-satisfaction of the 1980s was itself eventually challenged by a new mode of extravagant self-criticism, which seemed to obtain popular appeal at some point in the 2000s. That was when people became more and more cynical and more and more rationalized in their cynicism. In other words, we have been observing the cycle of sentiment in motion for the past three quarters of a century, if not for much longer than that. The, the transition from glib self-satisfaction to extravagant self-criticism back to glib self-satisfaction and so on and so forth. I would suspect that there are probably several books written long before The Lonely Crowd in which the same phenomenon is observed by other people, though they probably describe it with different terminology. And all of this reminds me of a meme that is currently popular among certain cynics. It is a picture of an American teenager standing outside the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in August of 2001. And this teenager is saying to himself, I'm so excited for the prosperous future awaiting my generation. Now, it is interesting to consider how quickly these shifts in popular sentiment occur, with optimism giving way to hopelessness and hopelessness giving way to optimism within a span of less than 20 years, not even a full generation. It doesn't even seem remarkable to us that Riesman felt himself prepared to summarize the 1950s in the year 1969, when he was not even yet a full decade removed from the conclusion of the 50s. Now, having said all of this, naturally we are keen to know what to make of it. Do we rest assured in the historical probability that a relatively carefree state of glib self-satisfaction will eventually succeed our current time of extravagant self-criticism? Or do we despair for the great likelihood that we will never completely overcome our tendency for extravagant self-criticism? Personally, I think it is foolish to expect our cultural conditions to serve us or satisfy us with opportunities for glib self-satisfaction. And I think it is equally foolish to lament their inability to do so and to respond to our own disappointment with despair. There is reason for humanity to feel both pride and shame sometimes even simultaneously, and there is a time to reflect on one and a time to reflect on the other. And I wonder if in the present era we are living not in a time defined by one or the other sentiment, but in a time defined by a conflict between both of them at once.